the Lord spoke a word to me, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, I want my church. I bought this church with my blood. I purchased it. It belongs to me. It's my church. It's my possession. And I want it to be a source. He didn't say he wanted to do something. He didn't want it to have something. He wanted his church, and that's us, beloved. He wants his church to be a source, first of all, a source of light. Jesus said in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, I'm the light of the world. A little later on he said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And he said to the disciples, you are the light of the world. And in the land of darkness, God wants a people that are a source of light. I want to read this in John's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse 37. In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, that they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Hallelujah. I'd like to read that in the New American Standard also. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Some of the multitude, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Amen. Now he said, They that believe on him... Out of their belly shall flow a river, out of their innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, running water. In other words, they were a fountain. They were a source of not one river, but many. And this is what God wants a people to be, to have something within that lets, uh, that's a source that lets the nature of God flow out. And the first thing that he said to me was, I want my people to be a source of light in this world of darkness. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world among whom you shine as lights in the world. Amen. In a world of darkness, in a world steeped in ignorance, God wants a people that will shine and be a source of light. Daniel said it this way in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, 2, and 3. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Amen. So there is a source of light in the heavens. This would be a dark place indeed, were it not for the source of our light, which is our solar system and our sun, and the other great solar systems and suns that are out there in the the galaxies and the universe that we see at night. What a dark place this would be. There would be no sight. 
there would be no light. Hallelujah. God wants a people who are a source of light. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 and 2, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. What is it? God sees a people here who are a source of light. I don't mean they are not just going around carrying torches. They themselves, that people, that body, that church, is a light within itself. Because within it, it has the divine nature of the Almighty, and He Himself says, The Lord will rise upon thee, and His glory will shine about thee. And the glory of the Lord within His church becomes a light, and they become the source of light for the nations, until kings come to the brightness of their rising. Now, light is very necessary to us. First of all, light exposes filth and uncleanness. Now, were it not for light, if we all lived in the darkness, there would not be much chance that we'd know just how dirty our surroundings were, or our neighbors, or ourselves. People who live in a dark place, or who are in a dark place for a lengthy time, and suddenly come out the light, all of a sudden there's exposed to them the dirt and the filth that's upon them. This is what the labor was for in the tabernacle. was in the light of day when they came up to the labor and looked and saw they could see themselves in that piece of furniture made out of the looking glasses of the women that they might see what they looked like and within that labor was a water to wash a source of life, a light. That light to expose the need for cleansing. When people do not know that they need cleansing, they do not seek the cleanser. People in the world today who don't, are not around the light, they don't seek God for the cleansing of their sins. They don't know they're dirty. Talk to the murderer. The dope dealer, the rapist, the kidnapper that's in the prison. And ask him how guilty he feels. He'll tell you, I'm not so bad. I'm not near as bad as that fellow in the next cell to me. Oh, he's really bad. And they don't feel their guilt because there is no light. They don't dwell around the light. But God wants in this world of darkness... In this world where men's minds have been steeped with sin and atheism and uh, idol worship and heathenism, God wants a people that will be a source of light so the world can see their need. Hallelujah. Light shows us the way. When Jesus was here, he was the light of the world. He showed the people how to walk. He showed the people the way of God. He came to manifest the works of the Father. And he was a light that showed people the way. He said, I am the way. And they knew the way because he was the light, the source of light in the world, to show them how to walk. Hallelujah. Those who didn't want to walk with God hated him for it. Because the light exposed their sins. While they could creep in the darkness and be covered, they felt safe enough. But when the light came, they were exposed and they hated him for it. Jesus said, I, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But then he said, you are the light of the world. 
You, church, are a source of light to show the people God's way. And God help us so we show them the right way. If we don't shine the right light to show people how to walk before God, how uh, to get on the way to glory, the way to life, straight is the gate, narrow the way that leadeth to life. And few there be that find it. Why? Because there's not enough light in the world. There's too much darkness. Men are walking in darkness. There are men who have come to their old age. And finally somebody visited them and talked to them about Jesus. And they have said, you know, in my whole lifetime nobody ever asked me to be saved. Nobody ever told me about Jesus. Have you ever heard of anybody like that? that went through the whole lifetime and no one ever tried to show them the way. What were happening? They just wasn't their circle of friends. They just didn't have the uh, people around them to show them the way the people they walked with were all people who also walked in darkness. And that's the way the majority of the world is today. The majority of this world walks in darkness. And sometimes that which claims to be the light is pointing people the wrong way. God wants a people who are a source of light in the world. Hallelujah. God wants a people who are a source of life in the world. In John chapter 1, when Jesus came, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made, in him was life. Now, without him, there was no life. Everything was just mineral. Just It was just uh, water and dirt and, and uh, uh, flesh. But there was no real life outside of Jesus Christ. But when he spoke, when that word came into contact with the cosmos, Something began to happen. Life began to come forth. He spoke the fishes began to swim. He spoke the birds began to fly. He spoke the animals began to breathe. And he spoke the breath of life into a man, and he became a living soul. Hallelujah. In Jesus Christ was life. He's imparted that life to his church. He wants a church that is a source of life into the earth. In Mark chapter 16, he says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 15, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. How can they lay hands on sick people and cause them to recover? Do you think God is trying to say to us, all of you go to chiropractic school and learn to lay hands on the sick and make them recover? No, he's not talking about chiropractic school. He's talking about a source of life in his people, in his church, where they can touch somebody and life flows into them and the sick get well. Hallelujah. Now it takes a miracle to restore a limb, put in a new tooth, to restore an eye that isn't there. It takes a miracle to do some of those things. And there's been a lot of miracles. Work God has worked a lot of miracles. There's been people that's had a kidney taken out, and later they are re-x-rayed and found out after God had healed them, they had now two good kidneys. And the doctors could not understand how that could happen. Now, these are record on cases, cases that are on record of these things happening. Those are miracles. That goes beyond just healing. But... When a person is sick and he is healed, it's because life heals him. And there's a healing takes place. There's within our own body, 
enough life that normally, if we catch a cold or we get the flu or something goes wrong, we get uh, an abscess or most anything, a sickness comes along, there's something within us, life within us, that fights against that sickness and tries to overcome that sickness. Sometimes our own body is able to overcome and to throw off sicknesses. Sometimes it's not. That is why God says, in my church, there'll be those who will lay their hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. There'll be life poured out. In Second Peter, chapter 1, and verse 2 and 3, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us, his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. Hallelujah. All things that are given unto us pertaining to life and godliness. Hallelujah. God wants a church and a source of life. You know, death prevails in this world. If you left this world to itself without Christ in it, it would not take it long to go completely into corruption, chaos, decay. Life would leave it. It would destroy itself in a short time. The preservative in this earth is the salt of the earth, which he said, you are the salt of the earth. That's that which preserves what life there is in this earth. And God wants his church to be a source of life. Wherever you are, on your job, with your neighbors, in your school, in your church, you have the right to walk in this truth that you can be a source of life. If someone needs life, stretch out your hand. You say, I'll run and get the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, somebody. No, no. He told those people back there, you stretch out your hand and lay it on the sick, and whosoever believeth, these signs shall follow them. Of course, the Apostles believed, and mighty wonders were wrought by the hands of Paul the Apostle, to the extent that they even took clothing off of his body, handkerchiefs from his body. What for? Because there was so much life in him that the radiation of that life was saturating the very garment that he wore. And they would take handkerchiefs and aprons, garments from his body, and send it to people who were demon-possessed, and the devils would flee when it came near to that garment. What was it? They felt the life that was in there. There was something about this life of God that radiates and saturates everything around us if we're full of it. And Paul the Apostle was a man that was committed to God and so dedicated to God. He was so passionately given over to God that his whole life radiated with the life of God. Hallelujah. I long for that. I, um, I claim it. Hallelujah. Because the needs are here now. And Paul isn't here to meet those needs. The other day somebody wrote me with a great need down in Texas and, and uh, they gave me the letter to answer and they, they needed a prayer cloth so they, we have a little prayer cloth there we pray over and they put a prayer cloth in there and I just felt led. I just took out one of my handkerchiefs and, and uh, that I've been carrying in my pocket, have been around with me, and, and uh, hoping there's some godliness had radiated out there in it. And I took it out and clipped off a, a square of it, and I just uh, um, put it in the envelope there. Praise the Lord. I don't know. Maybe they'll think I'm a nut when they get it, you see. But just the same, if there is an effect, if that, if that is true for us today, and I believe it, it is, that we can claim the same promise that the apostles back there claimed, and let the life of God radiate out of his church today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are a source of life in the world. That's why God is not going to jerk you out of this world. That's why he's not going to take you out of here, because he loves this world. He so loved these sinners out here that he gave his son for them. 
for you too when you was a sinner. He loved you when you was a sinner. He loves those that are out there that haven't found Christ yet. And he gave his son for them, and he loves them so much, he's not going to take the source of life out of this world, but he's going to let it pour out life until it saturates this world with the life of God. And a great harvest is reaped. Hallelujah. God wants his church to be a source of love. And we talked about the church is a fountain, rivers, fountains, rivers of living water springing up from your innermost being. And there's a great need for love in the world today, real love. Not love based upon just response to what somebody else has done for you. Somebody comes and hands you the keys to a brand new automobile, said, here, I just felt I want to buy you a car. I just like you. And I what a response of love you feel towards those people. What a response. Your heart just wells up with love to that one. That's a responding love. That's a love by cause. But God wants a people that's a source of love that doesn't require a cause. They flow with love like a fountain of rivers of living water flowing out. Those kind of people can love their enemies. Those kind of people can bless those that despise them. Those kind of people can bless those that curse them. Hallelujah. Because they're a fountain of source of free-flowing love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody one time accused me falsely, thank God, according to their definition, of believing in free love. You believe in free love? It sounds so funny to me. I said, is there any other kind? I mean, what, does, do you have to pay for your love? Well, I don't believe in free lust. I don't believe in sinful sex. But I believe in the love of God, and I believe it ought to be free, and there shouldn't have to be something that pays for that love to make it respond out of you for something. I believe that God has a people who are a source of love, that spread their love, and rivers of love flow out, out of His church, so people feel that, and when they come into a crisis in their life, they're going to seek the source of love that will bring them to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want my church to be a source of truth. Of truth. Pilate back there, and I think that he was probably sincere when he said to Jesus, What is truth? Men have asked that question down through the ages. What is truth all about anyhow? You read a medical book today, 30 years from now, this book is all wrong. We've been experimenting on people Human guinea pigs, cutting them up, putting this dope into them, putting that chemical into them, trying to cure this, with killing more people than they cure sometimes. Hallelujah. And uh, burying the mistakes because they don't have the ultimate truth in medicine. Read the doctor books of a hundred years ago. Read what the doctors used to practice on people 500 years ago. You say, oh, they were primitive. 500 years from now, people will say, you is primitive. 500 years ago, those people were much more up-to-date and modern and scientific than the people 500 years before them. Why? Because the truth as man knows it continually changes. They continually learn more about things. And man is continually asking, what in the world is truth anyhow? Hallelujah. Is there any absolute truth? Hallelujah. One professor, learned professor was speaking to some college kids one time, and he was saying there is no absolutes. There is no absolutes. One young bearded, hippie-looking boy sitting on the front, down the front, looked at him very innocently and said, Are you absolutely sure? 
<laughs> Hallelujah. But the world seeks for truth. In First uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the hope that lieth in you. Hallelujah. In the book of Timothy, he says, Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants a church in the world that is a source of truth. And, beloved, he's going to mature this church. He's going to grow his church up until it becomes the source of truth in the world. Until the nations flow into Jerusalem, the church, to find the wisdom of God. How to run the nations. How to solve the problems. Truth ought to reside and will reside in the fountain of life in the earth. And that's his church. I want my church to be a source of truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Today we have the thousand names of Babylon. And in the thousand, under the thousand names of Babylon, we've got 5,000 different doctrines. And people are confused. And they close their mind because they hear so many different things. They just close their mind on one thing and say, that's enough. I'm not going to look at anything else. And God is saying, I want a church that is a source of truth, where people can find the truth of God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Amen. He is the source of truth. He is the source of life. Hallelujah. Thank you. And He desires to be the head of of his body, the church. God gave Jesus to be the head over all things to his body, which filleth the church, his body, the fullness of him who filleth all in all. Hallelujah. I want my church to be the source, the fountainhead of deliverance in the world. Joel chapter 2 and verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Now this is talking about, the context of this is talking about the last days. This is what Peter said, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. With a pouring out of his spirit upon his church, they become a source of life to the world. They become a source of truth. They become a source of deliverance. Verse 28 says, It shall come to pass after thou pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Where is deliverance found? He said, in the last days, in the days when I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, in the days when the sun is darkened, and the moon shall be turned to blood, when a star shall fall, and blood and fire and pillars of smoke, wonders in the heavens and in the earth. And he said, in that hour, I'm going to have a city. I'm going to have a church. I'm going to have a people 
wherein shall be deliverance. They will be a source of deliverance in the world. Let me tell you something. Jesus didn't come to the earth to heal every sickness that was upon the earth and to run every sickness off of the earth so that people could live there on after for the rest of the next few millenniums without any common colds, without any cancers, without any leprosy, without any arthritis. He didn't come to heal all the sicknesses and to destroy all the afflictions of man upon the earth. Had that been his purpose, obviously then he failed at it. Because he didn't do it, he's still here with us. But what he came to was to place himself within a body, a people, a church, that should become a fountain of deliverance and should work in that and let that thing flow until every enemy shall be put under feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death, sickness, arthritis, cancers, every demon known to man, every sin, every affliction known to man shall be destroyed because in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, in the remnant whom he will call, in that people, in the last days when he's pouring out his spirit, when the great mighty signs and wonders are being seen in the earth, in that hour they are a river of life, a river of deliverance, a source, a fountainhead of deliverance to the world. And I am convinced, and I will preach it, that there will be a revival in this world and that God will not have to split this world with an atomic holocaust or a bomb and blow it out of space to get rid of all the germs. Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes you wonder if God is in order to get rid of all the germs. We're certainly not going to take them to heaven with us. So in order to get rid of all the germs, all the Roaches, all the rats. Do you know mankind has never been able to destroy rats and roaches? They're with us. And they're going to be with us as long as sin is with us. So to destroy the thorns and the thistles and the germs and the bugs and all these things that are enemies. No, God isn't going to have to destroy this. But there's going to be a revival of the righteousness of God and of outflowing of deliverance until this creation is going to be recreated. Yes. Acts 3.21 says that Jesus must remain in heaven until the times of the restitution of all things spoken of by the prophets. That word restitution has a very interesting meaning. And uh, other translations say the restoration. That's what the Greek word means. One translation says, until all things are put right until everything is brought back into its original pristine glory, until the whole world is recreated. There's going to be a time of restoration, a deliverance in this world. And God has a people, and I am talking to them. Hallelujah. And they're not shouting yet. So there's something wrong with my preaching. But I'm looking at the people at least a portion of them, that is going to be the fountainhead, the source of a deliverance from this creation, and all creation is groaning and crying for that tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. I was preaching in a little town in Arkansas, and some of you heard this story. Well, Lord, if there's ten that haven't heard it, can I say it again? <laughs> if there's ten that haven't heard about the, the little church in Arkansas where... It was raining one night, huh? All right. Well, let me tell it. I went to preach in a little place called Fox, Arkansas, I think it was. Out in the country, about five miles. A little church house. I hadn't had a pastor for some number of months. And, and I was teaching Bible school in Memphis, Tennessee. This was back in the uh, 1950s. And I had a student there that was free and and uh, able to go pastor a church. So some of the people that contact me, and they said, well, uh, could you come and preach for us? And I said, yes, I will. I'll come up and hold a week's revival, and, and I'll bring a young man, and, and if everything works right, why, well, we can just set him in as pastor. Okay, so we went up, Jim and I, and uh, Brother Jim Motter, and we held a meeting there Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, 
And then on Wednesday night, when we got there, uh, a couple of preachers, three preachers actually came in. Two of them had previously pastored this little church. And they were hard, uh, hard-shelled, Pentecostal, rip them and fight them type of preacher that was against everybody else except them and their four and no more. And so they were coming, they were dead set against me and anything they'd heard about what I was preaching. It's a long time before I did any writing. And so I could feel the Spirit when it, we started. So we hadn't started the service long until it started raining. It was one of those nights in Arkansas we had what we call a gully washer. It really washes the gullies out, you know. The, so it poured down. Didn't have a ceiling in the place, so the rain was beating on the roof. And I was quite a bit younger. And my voice was strong. I didn't have a microphone, anything like that. But I didn't need one then. And uh, when I saw where these men were from, I mean, where they're coming from, their spirit, and they were opposed to us and all, well, I... I tried to reach out to him. I called on one of them to offer a prayer, and I called on the other one to lead the testimony service. So he got up to lead the testimony service, and he preached a little while while he was up there. And he told the people he didn't believe these false prophets are going around the world telling everybody there's going to be a revival. said, these folks that believed in prophecies and God spoke today through people, said he spoke back there through Isaiah and and through Elijah and them prophets back there, but he didn't speak today through people. And that um, and there wasn't going to be any revival. Things were going to get worse and worse. It was going to get so bad that pretty soon it would be going like it was in the days of Noah. And in Noah's day, don't you know, only eight of them got saved. And he intimated that he and his wife were two of those, and he didn't know exactly who the other six were. I doubt if he'd gone along with them if he hadn't known. But anyhow, when he got through, and I got the pulpit back, I said, well, I appreciate my brother taking this liberty to tell it like he sees it. And I know he won't mind that I'm going to tell it like I see it now. And I preached revival. I was seeing it then, and I'm seeing it now. That God's going to have a people in the world that's going to be a source of revival, a source of life, a source of deliverance for this world. He's not going to let the devil take this place over and eight of us fly away like Noah didn't. And uh, <laughs> anyhow, while I'm preaching, the rain is raining hard on the roof. And I don't know that the Lord is about to trap me. But while I'm preaching, you know, and everything is real tight, because a lot of those people knew those preachers, two of them had pastored there before, and and uh, they were country folks, you know, and, and blood's thicker than waters, you know, and, and especially if it's country blood in Arkansas. And, and uh, so I was just kind of a stranger, and, and things were kind of tight. And so uh, while I'm preaching, and I know I can feel how it is tonight, why... Uh, the Lord said something to me. He said, Son, I'm going to work a miracle here tonight to prove that I can still speak through lips of clay and that you preach the truth tonight. And that was what he was saying to me while I'm preaching. And I said, Glory to God. I don't know what the miracle's going to be, but praise God. You know, God's going to confirm his word. So when I got through preaching, I said to the folks, I said, Stand up now and and uh, you don't want to be saved. God will work a miracle in your life. No matter what's wrong with you, no matter how bad you are, God wants to work a miracle here tonight, and he'll save you tonight and transform your life. And they just stood there and looked at me. No response at all. That didn't work, so I said, Everybody wants the Holy Ghost. Come out here down the aisle and get in the altar here. Let me pray over you. God will fill you with the Holy Ghost tonight because he's going to work a miracle here tonight. Nobody. Nobody. They just looked at me. It was quiet. Well, I fell back on Old Faithful. Down there in Arkansas at those days, uh, everybody got to come to get a free treatment because uh, there were miracles were happening and it didn't cost me anything to get in line anyhow. And who knows, God may do it tonight. I said, everybody wants to be healed. Line up across the back, come down the side wall and across the front here. God's going to work some miracles here tonight. And I don't care what's wrong with you. 
You get up here, and we're going to pray, and God's going to work a miracle. Come on, right down this side here, and round across the front. Nobody moved. Not one. Aren't you sick? Nobody's sick here tonight. They just looked at me. The Bible said they answered him not a word. <laughs> you mean to tell me that of this crowd here and the one person who needs divine healing? No response. They just looked at me. Well, I didn't know where to go from there. I said, okay, we're going to close the service. And let's come down and pray. Seek the Lord. And so some of the saints came down. They started praying. And I mean, they was beating on the altar, you know, and those preachers over there just uh, screaming and a holler and beating. And, uh, and I, I laid my head on my arms and I was praying kind of quietly. And you could hear the rain was beating on the roof. And I could hear those preachers over there praying. I was thinking, why wouldn't they pray a while ago when I need to get somebody saved? And uh, but the Lord said to me something. Look at your watch. That's strange. I looked at my watch. It was ten minutes after nine. Now, what's that for? And uh, anyhow, I went on. I had my head down. I wasn't making a lot of noise. I was just kind of praying quietly. All of a sudden, it dawned on me that everything was real quiet. I didn't hear the preachers praying anymore. And I, I, I looked around. I lift my head and looked around. And I was the only one on the altar. Everybody else was back in their seat. And the Lord said to me, look at your watch. And I looked at it, and it was 13 minutes after 9. Three minutes. They had spent in that altar. Praying up a storm. Back in their seat already. And, but this time I'm getting provoked. I didn't know the Lord had a trap set for me. And I got up, I was standing down in front behind the altar. I said, now folks, I want to say something to you about your prayer life. I said, I know you won't mind me talking just a little bit more because uh, it's raining so hard that you couldn't get to your car anyhow. You're going to have to stay in here a while till it slacks up. And when I get through telling and talking to you about your prayer life, I said, I'm going to command it to stop raining to prove to you that I preached the truth tonight and that uh, God can still speak through lips of clay. And I was horrified while I heard. <laughs> I, I looked at those preachers. I saw them look at each other. I knew what they were thinking. We called him a false prophet, and now he's going to prove it for us. How do you get out of a situation like this? I'd already said it. I went ahead and told them how proud I was that they were so consecrated out of only 24 hours in a day, they actually could give God three minutes in the altar to pray. I was really amazed. I was a little sarcastic, is what I was. But when I got through speaking for a few minutes about prayer life, I said, okay, everybody stand up. And the rain was still... I was hoping I could hear it slack off, but it wasn't. I said, everybody stand up. And we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to stop it from raining now so you can get to your cars without getting wet to prove to you that we have preached the truth to you tonight. And that God is moving in revival and that He's and He can still speak through lips of clay. So they all stood up. And I prayed a very sincere prayer. I was hoping the Lord was listening. I said, Lord, you heard what I said. And I said, now send his people home. Bring us back tomorrow night. Another service. And I said, now, Lord, stop it from raining so they can go to their cars now to prove that we preach the truth. Amen. And I stood there. My eyes shut, my head down, waiting and listening. And the rain just pounded on the roof. It didn't slack up. I was waiting. Nothing happened. I didn't look up. I didn't want to look up. I said, God, don't expect me to lift my eyes and go back there and shake hands with those folks and invite them back to church tomorrow night, tomorrow night like a hypocrite. If this word don't come to pass, I'm a false prophet. I'm going to sneak out of here after everybody's gone. I, and I won't raise my head. I won't speak to nobody until they're all gone. I'll get my coat. I'll slip out of here. They'll never see me in this part of Arkansas again. Now, that's the way it is. And I stood there and waited. Nothing happened. I don't know how. It might not take all this time to me talk. I was talking fast to the Lord. But I was thinking, there was a room back here, a Sunday school room on each side behind the platform. 
And I'd been in that room over there, but I hadn't been in this room, and I was just wondering if there was a door out over here. If I could go out that way, I wasn't going to go out this way. And I still hadn't opened my eyes, and I was standing there waiting for something to happen, and my friend, the student who came with me, started prophesying, Brother Jim. Brother Jim had been to this church and verified this story. He was there. And anyhow, he started prophesying. And I listened very carefully to what the Lord was saying. And he was encouraging our hearts to listen to the word of the Lord, believe what God says, and so forth and so on. And, and as he's prophesying, all of a sudden, he just stopped. He didn't dribble down, you know, to a little finish. He just stopped suddenly. And the echo died down, and everything was real quiet. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, it wasn't raining. You couldn't hear the pounding of the rain on the roof. And then I started having a camp meeting. I felt good. <laughs> I lifted my head and I said to the folks, all right, folks, it stopped raining. Now you can go home tonight. Come back tomorrow night. We're going to continue the revival. Praise the Lord. And so I stood there and they, you're dismissed. And they all start shaking hands, you know, and like to hear at the house prayer sometimes. It takes, it takes you a half an hour, 45 minutes to get people out after you told them the service is over, you know. And they were shaking hands and all and talking to each other and how's the hogs and how's the corn doing, you know, and this, that, and the other. They hadn't seen each other for a long time. And and so uh, I stood there and watched that for a few seconds and all of a sudden I wrapped on the altar bench in front of me and I got the attention. I hollered till everybody stopped and looked up there and I said, let me tell you something, folks. You gave God three minutes in the altar service tonight. He's going to give you three minutes to get to your cars. Now, if you don't get there in three minutes, you're going to get wet because it's going to start raining again in three minutes. Hallelujah. But this time I knew I was talking in the Lord, see? <laughs> and so I started getting them out. Let's go. You heard what the Lord said. You say, let's go. Let's get, let's get going for it. while it's not raining. And finally got everybody out. I got in the coat. And Jim run and got in the car. And by the time I got the door shut, the lights out, my coat on, run, it started drizzling again. And by the time I got in the car and slammed the door, before I could turn the key on, it heavens opened and down came the deluge again. Hallelujah. They didn't forget it long around there. But I tell you what God was saying to us that night, there's going to be a revival. There's going to be deliverance in this world. He will confirm His Word with signs following. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. Obadiah, chapter 1. It better be chapter 1. Hallelujah. Verse 21. Hallelujah. Oh, let me read verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. And there shall be holiness. Hallelujah. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Did you know, house of Jacob, we've got some possessions that we have not yet possessed. We've got some things that we've been sealed for. Ephesians said you have been sealed to the day of redemption until we fully possess that which has been purchased, until we redeem, the, we, we possess the, the uh, purchased possession becomes fully ours. We've been sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And he said, Up on Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau. That's the man of the flesh. That's the brother of Jacob who was the earth man. The house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. There's going to be the people, brother, that's going to put everything of the flesh to the cross. They're going to burn them with the fire of his word. There's going to be a flame kindled in Jacob, a fire in Joseph, and the flesh is going to be burnt until there's nothing remaining of it. God is going to have a people on this earth in whom dwells none of the Adamic flesh. He had one. Do you believe he had one? Do you believe he had a man that walked this earth, that ate, that brushed his teeth, how whatever they used to brush their teeth with back there, and uh, that combed his hair in the morning when he got up, that uh, 
uh, that put his shoes on one at a time just like you do, and he had none of the Adamic flesh in him. That's right. And when Satan came to him and searched him out, he couldn't find anything in him that belonged to him. Because, you see, the thing that Satan was promised, that dust shalt thou eat. And Adam, he says, thou art dust. But there was none of that dust for Satan to eat in Jesus. There was none of that Adamic in Jesus. God had a man in the earth, in the earth, in which there was none of Esau, none of the flesh remaining. And that man was planted in the earth to bring forth a harvest in his own likeness, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, that we might be conformed to that image, that we who have borne the image of Adam might therefore bear the image of the Lord from heaven. So therefore I declare to you by the word of the Lord that there will be a people, not up in heaven somewhere, not in glorified bodies, but walking this earth here, right here, going to the barber shop, eating breakfast in the morning, running to catch the streetcar, whatever. And they're going to have none of the demic nature in them. Hallelujah. You know something? People think about that and they think, that's got to be Superman. That's got to be a superhuman or something. Well, I guarantee you there was something special about Jesus. But the little children, when they run up to hug his neck and to pull his beard and to play with him, they didn't think he was a Superman. They just thought he was a very nice gentleman, a very lovely person to be around, a real nice guy to play with. That's right. Hallelujah. And I guarantee you there's going to be a harvest out of that seed that was planted. For that seed did not die in vain. He died to bring forth a harvest in his own likeness. All right. So it says in verse 21, I want to read this in the New American Standard. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. The King James says, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. The word Savior means a deliverer. And God is going to bring deliverers up on Mount Zion. That's the high place in Jerusalem, the city of God. That's the highest order in the church. That's the sonship realm, if you please. The brethren of our Lord Jesus, Mount Zion. And deliverers are going to come on Mount Zion. And they're going to judge the Mount of Esau. Judgment must begin in the house of God. And if judgment begins in the house of God, then what's going to happen to the sinners and the unbelievers out there? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen in the house of God and the sinners is there's going to come some deliverers, there's going to come some sons that have been or had that nature of Adam eradicated by the indwelling nature of Christ breaking forth, and fountains of living water springing up within them, cleansing them, until there are going to judge the Mount of Esau. The flesh man is going to be put to judgment and put to the cross. Hallelujah. I want my church to be a source of government for this world. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God says, Let us make man. Hallelujah. Listen to it. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. All right. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 8. Hallelujah. Verse 4. Let me read verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? To think that all the things that God has created, the tremendous, fantastic works of art that God has created there, why does he spend so much time working with man? 
What is there about man that causes God to spend more time on man than any other part of his creation to pay a greater price for man than anything that he's ever bought or paid for or, or created? Amen. For he gave his own life for man. What is man that thou art so mindful of him? For thou madest him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and put all, hast put all things under his feet. Thou madest him to have dominion. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. For unto the earth... Verse 5 says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world, the age to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place, Psalms chapter 8, testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visiteth him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him with the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. What a destiny for man. He made man to have dominion. He made man to have a government. He said the government of this coming age is not going to be under the rule of fallen angels any longer. Philip's translation said, though fallen angels have ruled in ages past, had a place of principalities, princes of certain areas of government of this world, this age of darkness. Yet in the age to come, they will not have any governmental rule. This world will not be put under, their, under the government of angels any longer. But man will take the government of this world. God says, I want my church to be a source of government for this world. I created man to have dominion in this world. Hallelujah. And God is going to have a people that's going to rule and reign with him. Revelation chapter 5 brings it out so clearly. And he wrote to Timothy, Paul the Apostle did, and said, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Hallelujah. And the suffering that we go through now, he said, is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred upon us. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 5. Hallelujah. And they sung a new song, verse 9 says, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, he didn't say all the nations are going to reign. He said, you've taken us out of every nation, out of every tribe, out of every people. You brought people forth. And he said, we, that people that you brought forth, we shall reign on this earth. God said, I'm going to have a church. I'm going to have a people that's going to be a source of government in this world. And when that takes over, and Hebrews chapter 2 says, but we see not yet all things under him. But we see Jesus. The next verse, verse 9 goes on. Crowned with glory and honor. But we don't yet see all things under the feet of the Son of Man under the feet of man that he created to have dominion. We don't yet see all that coming together. We don't see that happening at this point. But he said, we know that this is what he created him for. This is what he has declared in the book of Psalms, that he made man to have dominion. And this is the way it's going to be. And when that happens, it's going to start a new age. And Satan and all satanic powers are going to be bound because a new government takes over. Hallelujah. You can be in that government. You can be in the governing force and the governing power of the coming age. But it's going to take a dedication. It's not going to take a half-hearted, slipshod, cold, indifferent, on again, off again. I might believe, think I will. 
Maybe that kind of attitude will never rule this world. The attitude in the hearts of those that are going to rule this world is that we're going to walk with God, live or die, sink or swim. We're on His side, and we're His, and we'll obey Him. And we'll love Him, and we'll walk with Him. Hallelujah. He's going to have a people. It's going to be a source of government. One last thing. God said, I'm going to have a people. I'm going to have a church. I want my church to be a source. Hold your seats now. Because I'm going to give you a scripture for this. I'm going to have a people that's going to be a source of divinity in this world. Praise the Lord. I'm going to have a people that's going to be full of the divine nature. That out of them flows a river of the Holy Spirit as clear as crystal that's going to bring life because it's the very nature of God Himself. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us Hallelujah. Notice verse 3. His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through, his, through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, these promises of God that's been given to us, by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Divine nature, that's the nature of God. God is going to have a people that have become partakers of the nature of God. They've been conformed to His image. They, have, they are now bearing not the image of Adam any longer, the image of the man of dust, but they are bearing the image of the man from heaven. They are bearing the divine nature of God. And in this world that has been corrupted and lost with the rule of the human family and under the guidance of the mind of Adam for these millenniums, to this human family is going to come a new mind and a new nature. It's the nature of God himself. And he said, I want a church. I want a body I can pour myself into. I want a house I can live in. I want a city I can dwell in. I want a temple that I can be the Shekinah glory of. I want a people that I can so fill them with all my fullness that they will have nothing in them but the divine nature of God and they will be a source of divinity and a source of the divine nature to the whole world around them. So that when people want to find God, they simply have to get his address and go to his house, and there he is. Hallelujah. And where is the house of God? Well, in my Father's house there's many mansions, many dwelling places. But the Father's house, my friends, is you. You are the house of God. Hallelujah. Whose house? Hebrews 3 says you are. And he wants to be at home. He wants to put his furniture in that house. Amen. I want to tell you something. In my house, if I were gone on a three-week trip, which I leave tomorrow, and I came home, and I found out there was a projector right... Now, this will not happen. See, I'm just a hypothetical case, all right? But somebody's got up a projector, and it's... On the screen is running X-rated movies. And in another room, there's a radio blaring with X-rated radio sounds and filth and all kinds of, uh, of sounds that are, that are just degrading. I want to tell you, I wouldn't feel home when I got home. I'd say, I ain't going to live in this place until something's cleaned up around here. Because this is not my type of living. If you went into your house and found that in your absence, everybody taking out the furniture and threw a bunch of straw over in the corner for you to sleep on, 
had a little trough there with some slop in it for you to eat. You'd have said, look, I'm not a hog and I'm not a dog and I'm not going to sleep here and eat there. I want some furniture that fits my way of life. Well, God has a way of life and you're his house and he wants in you the kind of furniture that makes him feel at home. He don't want the carnal mind. He don't want the slop of this world's uh, thinking. Therefore, he says in Romans chapter 12, Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body, your house unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed with all the furniture of this world. Don't let them fill your house up with their furniture, with their thinking, with their nicotine, with their intoxicating pornography. Hallelujah. I was going to say intoxicating beverages. Well, that goes along too. But there's things that intoxicate your mind as well as that which intoxicate your body. Don't let them put that kind of furniture in your house. God won't feel at home there. Make a place that he feels at home in. Young people, you can do this. I guess some of the young people are out in the other room. They're having a young people service. But any young people, you don't have to be 70 years old to be a saint. You don't have to be 70 years old to have a house where God likes to come and, vi and dwell in. I start to say, visit. I don't want him to visit my house. I want him to, I want him to come into his house. Yes. Hallelujah. Where people can visit him. I want him to have the furniture in his house that he feels at home. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's put within our hearts, in our minds, in our stomachs, the kind of furniture that God likes to live with. God's going to have a people that's going to be a source of divine nature in this earth. They're going to walk the face of this earth and men will not know them by their flesh any different from anybody else. But what they'll know them is by the Spirit because they'll have a nature that will not conform to the nature of this world. And men will be able to see God because he'll be in his house. Hallelujah. Would you like to be a part of that body? Would you like to be a part of that city? Would you like to be that house? That church? He wants his church to be a source of light, of life, a source of love, of deliverance, of truth, of government, of divinity. Let's stand and pray.